<laughs> hey everybody and welcome to today's Facebook Live event. Joining me today is Meredith Thompson. She is the Executive Director of Mountainy Health's Children's Advocacy Center. She's here to take you behind the scenes of the center and to answer some questions about how the center works. Welcome Meredith. Hi Leanne. It's great to see you. You as well. So Meredith, let's just start by asking, what is the Children's Advocacy Center? Tell us a little bit about it. Sure. So the Children's Advocacy Center is a place where we pull together a multidisciplinary approach to the investigation of allegations of various forms of child abuse. So what we do at the center is we're very child focused, very child friendly. Our, our mission is to make children feel welcome and comfortable while they're coming there. But then we also encourage that our investigative team members are present as well. So, so the reason we do it that way is so that the child doesn't have to keep telling their story. They don't have to travel to multiple locations. So we do invite law enforcement, children and youth. We also work with victim advocates. We also have medical providers on site as well for the medical exam component of a visit at the Children's Advocacy Center. Okay. So um, tell us, how does it work in regards to a referral to the center? How does someone um, get into the center? That's a really good question. So the only way that we take referrals is through children and youth services or from law enforcement. And the reason that we do it that way is we really want from the very beginning or as close to the beginning when that allegation of abuse is reported, we want to be sure that all of the necessary parties are involved from the beginning. So we want to make sure that everything is legally sound from the start. We have all necessary investigators involved from the very beginning. So that's the reason that we don't take um, referrals over the phone directly from someone that feels that their child has been abused or they're calling as a self-referral themselves. So once we get that referral, that's really where the CAC comes into play. So we, we use a coordinated effort. So what we do at the CAC is we're going to work with the family on scheduling the appointment so that it's convenient and comfortable for their schedule. And behind the scenes, we're also working with law enforcement, the DA's office, children and youth, and a victim advocate so that we can make sure that that chosen day and time is going to work for everybody. Again, to ensure that that child is at the center um, on a day that works for everybody, but it's also, we wanna make sure it's always in the best interest of the child and their family as well. Mm -hmm. um, so your role, it sounds like, it's really in reporting and investigating those um, claims of, of child abuse in that child-focused manner. Um, we also have on here in our, our news um, uh, tickler below, uh, the phone number for Childline. Can you tell us a little bit about Childline and how that works? Yes. So. This is where mandated reporters are going to make that report of the allegation of child abuse. So Childline is very, very important. And that is again, why we, we work with law enforcement and children and youth, because we know that Childline has received that report of child abuse and they have mm -hmm. filtered it through their process with their trained professionals to be sure that, that that allegation of abuse and that investigation can start where it needs to start from the beginning. So once, once a child makes that report, um, I know it can be a little intimidating, especially if it's a mandated reporter's first time making that report. I, I know what that feels like myself. I know what it feels like to make that report for the first time. But I always remind folks, just imagine how brave that little person was to come and trust you with what happened to them. Um, and so once you, you can go online and do it, you can call the number that's scrolling at the bottom 24-7. There are trained professionals waiting to help you through the reporting process and filing your report. And then that's really where it takes off from there. So if there are any mandated reporters watching right now, I know there's a feeling sometimes of, I wonder what happened with that report I made. I wonder what happened with that child. The majority of the time, they're going to wind up at the Children's Advocacy Center, wherever they are across the country. There, there's lots of CACs across the country. So just trust that that report is going in the direction that it needs to go to start that investigation so that that child can start the healing process because admitting that something has happened to them is really just the beginning, but it's a very important step. And so that's why um, we wanna make sure that if you or anyone you know, you feel is being abused or they've told you something and you're not sure, is it child abuse, is it not? We always tell folks, if you're stopping yourself and you're asking that question, 
mm-hmm. call Childline, go online. Um, it's very easy for you to set up your username and password. We encourage folks to do that um, from the start. Um, anytime they're going to be in a mandated reporting job setting, just have it set, have it saved somewhere so that you can easily log on um, and just file that report. Because again, mm-hmm. it can be very stressful. The first time you have to do that, hundredth time you have to do that, it never gets easier by any means. Mm-hmm. But again, I always remind folks, just imagine um, how brave that little person was to, to come and trust you with, with what happened to them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So maybe you can talk to us a little bit about what happens when police or Child Protective Services believe a child is being abused and kind of the moment they come into this center, what actually happens when they're at the center? Can you talk to us about that a little bit? Sure. So when folks arrive at the Children's Advocacy Center, again, the colors are bright. There's artwork all over the place. So again, we are very child centered all the way down to the size of the chairs in the majority of the rooms. They're very um, intended for children. So the family um, is going to be welcomed by someone on my team, whether it's myself or someone else on the staff. And we're going to get the family comfortable. So the child is going to come with Um, a safe person or someone um, who is the non-offending caregiver in that situation. And that could be a variety of individuals that law enforcement and or CYS has deemed as a safe person for the child to be with um, at our center. We're going to get them comfortable. We always offer them some, you know, a little snack if their bellies are empty or water, um, things like that. We do have some little toys to keep them busy in the waiting room. And then we really start the process from there. So we do try to keep things moving along. Uh, Meanwhile, law enforcement, if they're assigned to the case, has already shown up. CYS has already shown up. Um, Our team is already in place. And then we start with a tour. We do a really brief intake right now because of COVID. We're doing a lot of things over the phone so that we don't have to do even more in person. So a lot of that is happening ahead of the appointment. We do take everyone on the tour. So the child goes on the tour, that non-offending caregiver goes on the tour with us so that they can see what that interview room looks like. So we feel it's really important that the family's never sitting out in the front of our building wondering, where did my child go? Or um, wonder what it looks like. What does it feel like? We, We wanna take away any mystery from that. So that's why everyone comes along on the tour with us. And then once the tour is over, then our forensic interviewer is going to come out and she's going to introduce herself to the family as well as to the child before going back and starting the interview process. We feel that's really important um, so that the child knows what this individual looks like. The family knows what this individual looks like. Again, demystifying as much as we possibly can. Mm -hmm. And then the interviewer is going to take the child back and they're going to start the forensic interview process with our forensic interviewer. And then another component of The visit to the CAC is a medical exam with one of our trained pediatricians. So we are very fortunate to have two wonderful experts in their field that we do share with Belfont Pediatrics. Um, And so it's very convenient, but it's also great for us to have as a resource seven days a week. We always have a provider that we can consult at any time. So that is a part of the tour as well. We do show the family and the child what that medical room looks like. Mm -hmm. And the doctor spends some time with the child and the family ahead of doing that medical exam, again, to demystify, to answer any questions, to be very thorough, to ensure that the family and the child understand why that medical exam is so important, both for themselves, for their health, for their well-being, um, as well as for the investigation to make sure that we've covered all of our bases. Okay, great. Let's go back to the forensic interview piece that you uh, previously mentioned. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and why it's so important in the process? Sure. So we are very blessed with a specifically trained, specially trained forensic Mm -hmm. interviewer. Um, She spends all day, every day talking with children. And it's very important that folks understand that this is neutral. um, It's fact finding and it's unbiased. So that forensic interviewer's job is really to talk with that child about whatever that child wants to talk about during that time. So 
It is not to force a child to disclose anything. Actually, many forensic interviews wind up without a disclosure. It's really just to be sure that that child feels like they're in a safe place where they can talk about whatever they need to talk about. It's also mm-hmm. important that folks understand that um, this space is intended to be developmentally sound as well. So um, our forensic interviewer is trained on various developmental needs of children. So again, that's why our team approach is so important so that we can be prepared for that child to be there, make sure we have things to make them comfortable while they're in the interview room, while they're in the waiting room, so that we can ensure, again, that they are comfortable from, from the moment they walk in that room. And also trauma-informed. So we really do find that children who come to a children's advocacy center, they find that they're less anxious. They find that they were heard. They, they're, they're actually feeling less traumatized than before they came to the CAC when they weren't totally sure what to expect. Because when you hear that you're going to talk to a forensic interviewer, that can probably sound intimidating if someone doesn't understand exactly what that person is intended to do. So she is there to find the facts and have that conversation with that child. And it's whatever that child wants to talk about at that time during that visit. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. One of the unique elements of your center is the role of the medical staff. And you started to talk about this already. I wonder if you can tell me a little bit more about the role of the medical center at the Mount Any Health Children's Advocacy Center. Yes. So we are extremely fortunate, as I mentioned before, to have two providers who serve our advocacy center and see children um, that are coming in for a forensic interview. So we encourage all children, regardless of the allegation of abuse, to have that medical exam. Mm -hmm. The reason is, is the doctor can discuss things from hygiene, development, emotional things um, Mm -hmm. in a way that maybe doesn't come up on a regular routine visit to the pediatrician's office. You know, maybe that day, that week, that month, things have been going really well, but they're in a unique situation when they're seeing our provider specifically trained on children who have been victims of abuse and they know exactly what to look for. They have a way in discussing those things with, with that non-offending caregiver. And then there's also the, the team approach again, where our providers can consult with the investigative team, and so that that child doesn't have to keep going to multiple locations, right? They're, they're all there at the CAC. It's child-friendly. Colors are child-friendly. It's non-invasive. Um, it's very calm and welcoming. And again, we're fulfilling the need of that child to start healing, but we are also fulfilling the need of our investigative team members all in one visit as well. So We're ensuring that that child doesn't then have to go travel to multiple locations to finalize that appointment, if you will. So we're very fortunate to have those providers on our staff as well. Right. I would think that the very um, act of a child having to rehash or recount um, descriptions of abuse would be even um, further traumatizing for them. Um, So it's nice that you have all the resources brought to the child rather than the child having to go out to the different resources. um, Exactly. To tell their story. Okay, great. Well, it's clear that the center focuses um, much on children and helping them through a potentially challenging and really traumatic time in their life. I'm wondering, though, do you have any services that you provide for the non-offending caregivers or family members of those children? Sure. So we feel it is so important from the start of that referral coming to the CAC that 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 non-offending supportive caregiver is on board with everything that's going to take place. So when we are lining up the appointment and we're having that conversation with that non-offending caregiver, we are giving them all of the details of why you're coming to the Children's Advocacy Center, reiterating that same message that the caseworker may have conveyed to them or the detective or um, the police officer that responded to the call or something like that. We're, We're all on the same page in our message that this is really in the best interest of the child, but we also understand that this is not easy for a parent, for a grandparent, for a neighbor, for whomever it is that now is caretaking for that child. And it's also not easy on the siblings either. So whether that child um, 
the sibling is involved in the investigation or not, we want to make sure that everyone feels heard and taken care of as well. So we work very closely with various victim advocacy agencies across um, the, the center location of our, our central Pennsylvania area network that we serve. And they are there to serve the victim child, but they're also there to provide support for the family as well. So whether that's follow up on the investigation, what happens after the appointment at the CAC, or we're getting ready to go to court and we're really nervous and scared and we don't know what to expect. So our victim advocates are working tirelessly to ensure that from that moment that they engage with our family and the child at the CAC, their work continues on beyond even the investigation necessarily. They really form a long-term relationship with the clients that they're serving. So we do, we do. We take moments to check in with the family. Um, we spend time to make sure that there's no questions that they might have or um, just making sure that we eliminate as much anxiety and fear as we can because we all know that if we have our little person with us and we're nervous, they're going to start feeding off of that energy as well. So we want to make sure that um, we just we just get everybody as comfortable as we can. And we're very transparent. Um, so I know when I'm doing intake at the CAC, I'm always talking to the child, even if they're just little, to make sure that they don't have any questions. And I always offer to them, is there a way that I can make you feel more comfortable or another child feel more comfortable if you have any questions? Because I know it's scary and I know it's a new place and you're coming to talk to somebody you've never met before, but we want to make sure that you feel comfortable and that you feel heard today. And they're very honest with me, which I always appreciate. They don't hold back. Um, but I'm also asking that of the family member as well, because we want to make sure that they're feeling comfortable and as calm as they possibly can while they're with us. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Another question for you, and you touched on this a little bit. I'm um, wondering what happens after the so the forensic interview happens at the center, the medical evaluation, and then what happens next? What are the next steps that you find? So this is really where law enforcement, children and youth, the DA's office, this is where our investigators really hit the ground running with their investigation. So many times we get follow-up phone calls from families and we are always happy to take those phone calls. Um, that's really why we're there. Mm -hmm. is to field those questions to help those individuals call the right person. Nobody loves to keep calling the wrong person. You think you're calling the right person and you're like, I'm not getting the information I need. So we're always happy to be that resource for our families. But this is really where the investigation continues. And so many times our conversation with families is just asking them for some patience, even though it's hard to be patient. You know, we, we want to keep healing and we want to keep processing and we want to move forward. Um, and it doesn't always happen that quickly. And so I'm not the expert in um, the laws and all the steps that it takes to get to that point in certain investigations. But we do always encourage that there just be as much open communication as possible. So even if that family member is very distraught, they're upset, they're overwhelmed, many times we will offer, we'll say, you know, we need to call that um, mm -hmm. detective, or we need to talk to that caseworker about something else. Anyway, mm -hmm. we'll just mention to them that you would like to have a phone call from them and just an update to kind of ease your mind for the next couple of days, or just let them know that it's been on your mind and on your heart and that you're looking for an update. Even if it's that I don't have an update at this time, but just know that the investigation's moving forward. So mm -hmm. we are a really important piece of a really big puzzle. Yeah. And so we are there for the child mm -hmm. and for our investigative teams. And so, you know, it's kind of one of those things that we don't always have the answers in real time because we're not involved in all of the details of that investigation. But we do know that our teams are working tirelessly to keep that moving forward. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, I just want to share with you a comment from one of our viewers that popped up earlier. I'll throw it up here. Um, Charles is saying that Central PA is lo so lucky to have such a great resource and team at the CAC. And um, definitely what you just described is the role that the CAC plays in being that necessary touchstone 
throughout such an intense uh, process. Um, so we talked a lot about the services that you offer to children and their families, as well as with um, children and youth services and law enforcement. And one thing that's um, important to point out, which I think you mentioned, is that there is no fee to the family um, for these services. And that, that's great to know. Um, however, how is the center funded? How What keeps it running? Yeah, so we are, um, first of all, thank you to our viewer for that comment. Um, we feel fortunate to work with the teams that we get to work with. Um, I personally am forever humbled by the folks that I get to work with, whether it's law enforcement, children and youth, the DA's office, our victim advocates. I'm forever humbled at the work being done. So I'm grateful that um, those that know where we are and what we do, I'm just grateful to know that that the hard work is continuing and it's not easy, but it's very humbling. And we know that we're there for a reason and we don't charge. There's no charge. We, um, we work really hard with our foundation. So Mount Nittany Health has their own foundation, which we're so fortunate to have that mm -hmm. partnership. Um, and that I'm constantly, you know, we're having conversations about searching for grants and finding support and um, the efforts never stop. And so we are so grateful. We are grateful for folks that feel called to donate to the CAC and to the children. And I just want to extend thanks to anyone that has donated in the past or maybe watching this right now and thinking, how can I help? And in this world we're all living in, I know it's tough for people. I can tell you even a dollar, you know, a dollar can buy us some crayons or something. So I just want folks to know that every dollar literally goes to the children. And so that really actually makes my job easy when I'm telling people that I'm fundraising. I'm always fundraising, but it's literally so that we can continue to serve children and their families. It's so we can keep our doors open, our lights on, provide them with comfort and provide a space for our investigative team members to come so that they too know that the child is in the right place, the safest place, the best place for them to talk about what they need to talk about and to start healing. So um, the effort never stops. We are on the verge of a virtual event taking place this month, which is um, really exciting. I'm excited that the CAC was chosen to benefit from the charity ball. I was actually, I'm, I was in tears when I found out because it's very exciting. It's very humbling. Um, it's been a hard year for a lot of people and um, we've stayed open. We've seen children day after day and they're the reason that we all do what we do at the CAC and in law enforcement and in CYS and our victim advocates. It's the reason we all do what we do. But I'm really excited to see what happens with this virtual event. Um, because I think we're in a unique situation. So it's a tough situation, but I think it's unique. And so I'm really excited to see what comes of it. Because again, we're, we're here to help children. That's, that's it. We're here to make them feel heard. And so they can start healing and move forward and know that they do have a chance at healing and moving on and empowering others and knowing that someday they could be the reason that another child's brave enough to talk about what happened to them. So um, I'm forever humbled that we don't have to charge for our services. It's just, it's just awesome. There's no other way to describe it except it's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And also awesome, which you mentioned, um, is the foundation, the Mount Any Health Foundation's Charity Ball Committee, um, having announced that they are committing to raising funds this year, despite not being able to have an in-person event like we normally would do with the Charity Ball, but that those funds will go to benefit your advocacy center. Um, and more information about that is available at the website advocacyforkids.com. We'll make sure that we post that in the comments section of this live broadcast so folks could go there to learn more about how they can make a difference in a child's life by supporting those efforts. So Meredith, um, well, this was a lot to cover. Thank you so much for your time today and for taking us behind the scenes of the center. Um, of course, the center plays such an important role um, for children and their families um, who are going through an unimaginable time. Um, and those are children of center as well as surrounding counties. So thank you again so much for being here to share all of that with us. 
Yes, thank you so much for having me. I'm mm -hmm. I'm just thrilled that we can get this message out there. Um, absolutely. And before we let you go, I do want to just take a moment to recognize the Guiding Light sponsors of this year's uh, Mount Mini Health Foundation Charity Ball. So as we mentioned, the Charity Ball will take a new format this year due to COVID-19, but the needs go on and the fundraising continues. This year's uh, benefits will go towards the Mount Mini Health Children's Advocacy Center. And the uh, sponsors that we want to recognize are, are listed here. So that would be the medical staff of Mount Mini Medical Center, Alexander, bb and Geisinger, Highmark, and Penn State Health. So thank you once again, Meredith, for your time today. Thank you everyone for tuning in. For more information on the Children's Advocacy Center, go to mountnitney.org. Thank you. Thanks, thank everybody. you so much. See you next time. See you. <laughs>